All right, well, God's best to all y'all in the name of Jesus Christ. And uh, Jason, am I supposed to do something with this thing right here or what? No? Okay, I'll say it. Okay. I'm always playing catch up with technology. <laughs> well, today we're going to consider one of the questions in this series, 12 questions that uh, Jesus asked. And um, I don't know if you guys have been reading along and you know, covering these different records and everything. Uh, I imagine you're probably counting. There's, there's more than 12 questions that Jesus asked, right? <laughs> you, you all know that, right? Yeah. Uh, and it's, uh, it's like 307 questions. So just think about how long this teaching series would be if we <laughs> it's all on each one of all those. Uh, why 12? As John Belushi said, why not? Right? So we picked 12, so that's what we're working on, all right? And uh, something else, and as I was looking through this and checking out what some people have done research on about these questions, Jesus Christ was asked 183 questions. How many of those did he directly answer? None. Three. <laughs> that makes me think as a teacher, man, uh, you know, if the, if the main teacher was asked a lot of questions and he answered questions with questions, what a great teaching technique. So in this particular series, we're considering those questions to provoke more thought on our part, to think through so we can reason it through together and help to increase our own understanding as we study these things. So let's start out in our record here in Mark chapter 5 and in verse uh, 24 through 34 is what we're going to read. And I'll be reading from the ESV. And he went with him, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and spent all that she had and was no better, but rather worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out of him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? <laughs> and he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had, done, what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Wow, what a record. I love it. In this snapshot of a moment of time, if you just read this section, we see people pressing in to be with Jesus. But this is not always the case. In the beginning of this chapter, uh, we see Jesus healing the man of the Gadarenes. Now previously, this guy was a dangerous person. Uh, he lived in the tombs. He didn't wear clothes. You know, this is not the average guy you would see. And uh, he was quite the strong and dangerous individual that no one could even bind this guy. So then after an encounter with Jesus, he comes to his right mind. He puts on clothes and he's sitting around. And when the people in the town observe this, you would think what? I'm glad that guy got his deliverance, you know. I can go and do whatever and not have to be worried about my kids. No. These people were afraid. In Mark 5, 17, and they begged Jesus to depart from their region. Now, he was on the side of this um, sea that was the Gentile side. So he gets in the boat and he sails back to the other side. And now we see um, in this record, he encounters Jairus. And uh, the people laugh at him when he talks to them. 
in Mark 5, 39 and 48a. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they what? And they laughed at him. So he's getting a lot of different responses. People are afraid of him. People laugh at him. And then, uh, as we know, as he's been moving and traveling and ministering and performing several miracles and teaching people about the kingdom of God and doing many mighty works, people were actually offended by him. And you can read this in Mark 6.30. Here he goes back to his own hometown. And they say, is this, is not this the carpenter? the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and are not his sisters with us? And they took offense at him. So Jesus is not always popular or having people seeking him out. People actually didn't want him around. And they were laughing at him and they were offended by him. It's obvious that People didn't understand him. And you know what? It's still true today. He pretty much gets the same responses today. And it's interesting, some of the comments I see on Facebook and some of the folks I work with or whatever, how they perceive Christians and what they think, whether they're glad to hear it or whether they're not. Sometimes they think Christianity's silly because the book was written when the world was flat. (laughs) <laughs> That's one of the things that they've said to me, you know. Uh, so here I think we're seeing an illustration of the parable of the sower, of seed, sower and the seeds being lived out with real people. The seed is sown everywhere, and some falls on rocky ground, and the evil one comes and gobbles up the word. But some of the seed falls on good ground, And the change in people's lives is truly amazing. I know it was for me. And I think about that today for all of us here. Today, you and I are the sowers of the seeds of God's Word. And the entire world (laughs) is our field. And the good thing is, you and I are not responsible for the responses of others. Whether they laugh at us, or they tell us to go away, or they're afraid of the things that we're saying, it, that's not up to me. I do my best to be the best messenger, you know what I mean? But you, know, you, you don't always get the desired result that you think you're going to get. Uh, and you all know that. In this record of the woman with the issue of blood, we can see that she must have heard enough for her to believe. She must have believed that she could possibly get uh, her long, sought-after, and desired deliverance if she could just get to Jesus. So let's go back to Mark 24, and we'll go through 26. And he went with him. This is talking about Jairus. Uh, He came and presented his problem to him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. Man, you can just empathize with this record, seeing someone that's challenged, who's sought to do everything that she's known to do, and it, because of the culture that she lived in and the um, faith that she was a part of, there are certain rules imposed upon her that greatly impacted the way she lived because of her challenge. This woman had been hemorrhaging for 12 years, and the Leviticus in 1519, or yeah, 1519 through 30, it lays out some rules about people that have this particular condition. Under the law of Moses, she was considered unclean. This isn't just a temporary thing. This is something she endured for 12 whole years. Her husband couldn't touch her. 
without becoming unclean and have to go through all the ritual to become clean again. She could not enter in a place of public worship. So the place you think you would go to get answers, to increase your believing, and all this, so she couldn't even go there. She couldn't go to the temple or the synagogue. And whatever she touched became unclean. Can you imagine the huge burden this would have put on her and her family and her friends and her town and any place this lady went? She was stigmatized by her affliction. Her malady was physically debilitating and it was socially devastating. Because of her condition, she was forced to live in the shadows of society. She became an outcast among her own people. Life must have been difficult on many levels. First of all, if we think about the blood loss, I would imagine she would have been tired all the time. You know, I, I don't know what she would have had to deal with physically because of this particular malady, but it would have had its own challenges within it. Uh, body weakness and things like that. Then there was the stigma of living with an unclean person. Just think about how this would have worn her down as a person. Not only the physical aspect of it, but the mental challenge of what she was labeled as unclean. One thing as I think about this record and consider this woman and the challenges that she faced, she must have been a courageous person. Apparently she tried everything she knew and went to every person she thought that could possibly bring her deliverance. And all that she had in this world, she gave it away to try to get back to a life of normality. I'm not sure how she heard about Jesus, whether she overheard people talking about him or it was a family member that told her about him. She was convinced that her deliverance was with Jesus. So let's go to Mark 27. She had heard reports. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. <laughs> now let's just stop and consider the effort that she put forth to get to Jesus. Every person that she accidentally touched along the way to get to him would have been considered unclean. What a risk to take. What if they discovered who she was and the condition she was in and someone oh, raised the alarm, whatever. What would the crowd have reacted to her? Because now they were all considered unclean and had to deal with that and had to go do all these things that according to law to get clean again and sacrifice and everything else. It had to be brave for her to get, press through there, knowing that there could be this reaction if she were discovered in her voyage to get her deliverance. The physical effort to push through the throng must have been exhausting. She didn't know much about Jesus, but she was going to lay it on the line to try and touch him. She touches his clothes and bam! I mean, instantaneously, she was healed. I mean, she's going through this thing. It's through her mind or whatever. And then uh, what would it have been that she would have sensed? She knew the moment she had done it that she was healed. Praise God for her, right? <laughs> 12 years of all this suffering and all that she endured and everything and she had this idea she she's had in her mind man if i can just get to this teacher 
named Jesus who's been doing these miracles and helping all these people. And I mean, he reached out to the untouchable healing lepers. And sometimes there were Gentiles that received the deliverance. And she thought, man, if I can, I know that I can't approach him. I can't do anything, you know, legally. But man, if I could just get to him and touch him, and she does, and she gets her deliverance, what would she? What would be the sensation she would have felt? I don't know. I mean, the word doesn't tell us, but she knew right away something miraculous just happened for her. You know, curiosity caused people to press in to Jesus, the crowd that was thronging him, but faith led her to touch him we'll get to why that's significant here in a minute Mark chapter 30 and Jesus perceiving in himself that power had gone from him immediately turned around in the crowd and said who touched my garments wow and his disciples said to him <laughs> You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? <laughs> and he looked around to see who had done it. Now, Jesus is aware that a supernatural touch had occurred, but he's not supernaturally aware of who touched him. Isn't that interesting? You know, God must have worked in him in, in amazing ways. And uh, I, I look forward to the day that perhaps I can have a conversation with him and talk to him about, man, what was it like when you were here on earth and how God you know, worked in you? I mean, did you get the full picture or did you just get some pieces as you went? Or did you, did you know how it was going to turn out before it happened? Or did you just saw it and were blessed like everyone else? You know, All these great questions you think about, you're going to ask the Lord when you get to see him face to face. Right stuff. So let's think about this incident for five seconds in a row. <laughs> People were pressing and bumping into him on all sides, and he stops and asks his disciples who touched his clothes. He was aware that power had gone out of him. What does that feel like? <laughs> Huh? Did you ever think about that? I mean, I try to put myself in the in the in the shoes of the disciples that were with him. I think about that a lot. Uh, Pastor Will taught a few weeks ago about when Peter got out of the boat. You know, what would you have done? Would you have been the one holding on to your oar or whatever? You know, or would you have been Peter asking, Lord, is that you? I thought, you know, if it was me, I may not have been Peter and said, Lord, if it's you, call me. If I saw Peter get out of the boat, I think I would have drowned because I would have followed him. I would have said, man, if that's you, Lord, I want to get to you too. You know, I don't know. But it's fun to think about. And you think about these disciples that live with him and, uh, you know, Jesus in this situation, he stopped in his tracks and he wanted to consider what happened. <laughs> and I wonder, you know, I think about those disciples, they must have been in the dark a lot. <laughs> he was a teacher like no one else, you know? He did things and said things and broke with traditions and was eating corn on the Sabbath and all these different things. And he taught them amazing things and helped to elevate their understanding of what God intended when he put this word together, when he worked with his people to show him just how much he loved them and how far he would go with them. I would imagine, you know, they would have been confused a lot. You know, <laughs> don't you see all these people around here who ask you, who touched me? <laughs> right? <laughs> Pretty amazing. Who touched me? Verse 32. And he looked around, and that was Peter that asked that question too. You'll see that this record appears in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. 
and you can pick up a couple little extra details along the way if you read all three accounts. Mark 32, and he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear. Why would she be afraid? I didn't really understand that until one time I was um, at a meeting and I uh, just got done teaching and um, this uh, lady approached me. She was uh, a woman of Jewish faith and she was the mother of one of the folks that was um, a regular attendee of our meetings. And she said to me, she was like so moved by the teaching, she said, can I give you a hug? Sure, you know. She said, uh, in the Jewish faith, we're not allowed to touch the rabbi. They're not allowed to touch the teacher. This woman broke with tradition and went through knowing she could potentially make people unclean. And she touched the rabbi and got healed. And all of a sudden, fear is raining down in her mind she knew all the things she did to get there to try and get delivered it was kind of like she received this secret deliverance and now the teacher is aware that he had been touched and power went out of him and he turns around and he looks at the crowd who touched me now the word doesn't tell us but i wonder <laughs> what the expression was on Jesus' face when he said that. I would imagine it wasn't... <laughs> Who touched me? <laughs> right? I, was one like that. I, I, I can only imagine one of curiosity, perhaps. <clears throat> Who touched me? But this woman, man, oh man, she just got her deliverance and all of a sudden she's got to make... She's got to come clean. She's got to, you know... Obviously he knows something, <laughs> Right? Know something. I think about this this record is it's really illuminating. It says that she with respect fell down before him and told him the whole truth about her situation. Some people that had great needs came before him with humility to make their requests. And I think about previously in this record, uh, the one that this thing is set right in where Jesus has been met by a ruler of the synagogue. He comes before Jesus, falls on his knees, and he begs him to come heal his daughter that is nigh unto death. For you in this room that are parents, I'm sure that when you think about this scenario with Jairus, you can have compassion in his situation. He is going to this person that he knows can do miracles, and he humbles himself and falls on his knees and asks him and pleads him, would you please heal my daughter? It's gripping. When you think about that, this man no longer cared about his position because Jesus was not a popular guy amongst the leaders in the synagogue. Something interesting about this record, it only calls him Jairus once. The other four times it references him as a leader of the synagogue, a leader, a ruler. The word emphasizes that he's a ruler Yet he humbled himself and went to Jesus in faith, believing that there was something that he could do for his daughter. Same thing with this woman. When we consider the woman that just received her healing, her faith is on display big time. There, there's no denying that she believed that by getting to him, that he was going to be able to do something to help her in her condition. She breaks all the laws about her conditions 
and pushes through the press. And by faith, she reaches out to Jesus for her deliverance. Then, after she secretly receives her healing, Jesus seeks her out. And she too falls on her knees and bears her whole soul before the Lord and tells him the whole truth. It's really something. I think this woman is an example of the seed that fell on good ground. She heard something and she believed and she put it in her soul to do whatever it was going to take to receive what she thought would be available by approaching this teacher and getting her wholeness. Now I want to make something very clear that there was absolutely nothing magical about Jesus' clothes, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, he had lots of people bumping into him and, and people touching him and that sort of thing uh, in the crowd and in the press and that sort of thing. And we, we don't see about any other sympathetic miracles because they just kind of like walk by Jesus in the street. Whoa, my elbow feels so much better now, right? <laughs> nothing about his clothes, right? It has everything to do with this woman's faith and what she thought. Mark 5.34 And he said unto her, Daughter. I think that that's pretty significant that he said that. In our culture and society, I mean, a lot of times we're like, Hey, bro, what's happening? What's up, brother? Hey, man. Hey, cuz. You know, we'd like, hey, T.O., you know, all those different references to family names and that sort of thing. But in that culture, it's different. And the fact that he calls her daughter, man, I wonder how that would have ministered to her on so many different levels. In the whole canon of this stuff that talks about Jesus and the things that he did, Only one woman is called daughter. It's this lady right here. I don't know what she would have been dealing with in her mind and in her life. Perhaps she just had a conversation with her father, or or maybe it was something happened to Pat. Maybe she was disowned because of her things. I I mean, I was in the ministry one time uh, where people would sit down you after you got sick and ask you where you opened the door to get sick. (laughs) Right? that is not the thing to do. When people are ill, we feed them the word. We teach them. You know, maybe there's a lesson to be learned. Hey, if you do this, then this is going to happen. Okay, great. But you don't have to declench every situation, every illness, and every malady that you have to find out where you blew it. Some people are born blind. Where did they blow it? They didn't. Right? It's got to go back that we know about love. Him calling this woman daughter, just imagine how that would have melted her heart as she laid out her soul before him and told him all these terrible things that she endured to get to this point where now she believes or she feels like she's healed. And Jesus confirms it for her. He says, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. There's the finality. There's the full measure of it all. She doesn't have to guess within herself, whether she's healed or not, she knows. The Lord ministered to her specifically and individually and sought her out of a crowd. All these people who touched me because he knew that power went out of him. He sees this woman who's hurting, who's been an outcast of society for 12 whole years, and this, this minister, this teacher, this healer, the Messiah, seeks her out individually he hears her situation. He's moving. He's got the right thing to say to her. Daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go and be healed of your disease. That is great. I listened to a teaching from uh, Alistair Begg, and I really enjoyed what he said about it. He did a teaching on one woman's faith. He said, her touch had brought together two elements, faith and Jesus. 
Her touch brought together two elements. Faith and Jesus. Real faith saved her. She came privately. She left publicly. She came in pain and left in peace. That's beautiful. What a summation of this little record. In a way, this woman represents a lot of people today. She tried everything she knew and spent everything she had. It wasn't until she came to Jesus that she received her total wholeness. For her, she received a miraculous healing. What will it be for you? And you too in TV land. What will it be for you? Genuine faith is not magic. Also, not every healing is a miracle. But all wholeness and healing and good things are from the Father of lights, our Father, Jesus' Father. Now a person may say, I don't have a lot of faith. That's honest. As we say today, fair enough. <laughs> may not. But it reminds me of something that Jesus Christ said. He said, if you have the faith like the grain of a mustard seed, I don't know if you all can see that, but it's pretty teensy, <laughs> right? If you have the faith of a grain of mustard seed, nothing will be impossible to you. Think about that. He said it. Therefore, it must be available. A little faith goes a long way. God can take a little faith and with his amazing grace span the chasm of human despair and bring us into his kingdom of deliverance. Our pursuit of wholeness is a journey. Each one is different. And there should be no condemnation involved in this journey. Now, my wife and I, we've been blessed to see several miracles in our walk. And I'm truly thankful to God for every one of them. Now, this is the part of the teaching that Will likes to call the caveat emptor. <laughs> when I share these records with you, it's not me. It is God and his amazing power and his love for his people. I got to be a witness. I got to be there and see some of these things. So when I share these things with you, I want you to be aware of that. Um, Robin and I were doing a teaching, and uh, there was a lady in the audience that came up after the teaching and said, I've had ringing in my ear for six months, and halfway through the teaching, it just stopped, and I was able to be at peace and enjoy the rest of your teaching. I thought, man, God is great. <laughs> I, I don't know what happened there, but I know that it was something that she was dealing with, and then healed. Another time, Rob and I were in a park and we were doing a teaching about healing, <laughs> sharing some great records and some things that we had saw. And then the next day, this lady comes to me and she says, um, I wasn't sure, but I, I wanted to tell you that when you were teaching, my knee was instantly healed during a teaching. And I was so excited. I wanted to play volleyball, but I didn't want to press my luck. It's not luck, honey, but I'm thankful that, you know, you wanted to check it out. So she got home and she, you know, did some things, everything in her knee. And she didn't have to get a knee surgery after that. I told her I was going to share this incident. And she said, 
that was a great day. That was the first miracle that I received from God that day. Later, this lady was delivered of breast cancer too. God's great. There was another time that we were teaching, and in the course of it, we were sharing about God's power and different things like that. And the next day, this uh, woman approaches me, and she's a tall lady, and she was like, you know, strong looking and everything. And she's looking down at me. She said, I need to talk to you about your teaching. And immediately, I'm like, whoa, okay. Uh, I'm thinking, all right, I'm going to apologize first. I'm trying to figure out what it was. You know, I hope I didn't offend her, you know, and all these things are going through my mind. And she's looking down at me really serious. And she said that she had had a lifelong problem that uh, has plagued her for a long time and seen a lot of physicians about it. And there was nothing that they could do. They could help with symptoms, but they couldn't provide a cure. And uh, she said during a teaching, she noticed that something happened within her, like there was this cleansing that went from the top of her head down to the bottom of her toes. And afterwards, she talked to her fiancé about it, and he said, uh, man, that's really cool, man. You need to remember that for the rest of your life. And he went to do something else. He's like, wait, wait, come back. What are you talking about? And he said, that was God healing you. And she realized within herself that it's what it was, that she had been healed. And she started crying. And he started crying. And then she's telling me, and I'm crying. <laughs> the point of bringing these things up is that miracles do happen. And they are still available today. And sometimes it may not be an instantaneous thing. There have been times where uh, uh, I know someone that had kneeled on something and their knee got swelled up and then they end up this huge red stripe going up their leg and there's all this pain. They go to the doctor, they do a surgery, calls me on the way to the hospital. I'm praying for him and everything. And then the next day I go to see him and they had done a surgery, they laid his leg open and took all this infection out and whatever. And his wife was there and we prayed and everything. He calls me the next day after that and he says, uh, the doctor came in and he took the wraps off of my leg and he's like, oh my gosh. And I was like, what's the matter? And he's like, like the swelling's almost gone. And the incision is almost completely healed. And uh, the guy said, well, yesterday my minister came and he prayed for me. And the guy's like, well, I just want you to keep in mind it's going to take about a year to completely recover and you may walk well in for the rest of your life. And he's like, well, thanks a lot. <laughs> so within two months, this dude is 100% back to work with no limps, no nothing. Amazing how God goes. Now, that wasn't an instantaneous thing, but it happened accelerated. Another man I know had a log fall in his hand and crush his hand. It broke his bones and dislocated his ligaments and all this other stuff. He goes to the doctor. They wrap it up. They tell him, we're going to have to do a surgery on you tomorrow. He comes to see me. My wife and I, we pray for him. And then he goes back to the doctor and he tells him, hey, I'm not going to do this surgery because I believe God's healed my hand and we just need to see the manifestation of it. And he's like, what are you talking about? The longer you wait, the more permanent damage you're going to have. This needs to happen soon. He said, okay. He goes back to the doctor, not three days, three weeks later. They take an x-ray of his hand. They put the x-rays up. They say, sir, have you seen your x-rays? He's like, no. You need to come with us. He's thinking, oh, God. No, I'm not going to think that. I'm going to stick to the fact that I know God has healed my hand. They'd see the two x-rays side by side, and the woman says to him, Sir, I've never seen bones heal you themselves the way your bones have mended themselves. I've never seen ligaments reattach themselves. This, this truly is miraculous. You know what that dude said? He said, I only came back here to show you that God will heal his people. <laughs> I'd only known this man for about two months, and yet his believing was crazy high. And they said, well, we're going to give you some exercise to do for your hand. At the end of the year, you should be able to close your hand this month, about this much. Okay. He goes back two weeks later. They said, let's check on your progress. He goes, 
almost completely closed. Amazing. Later, he's at a farmer's market. They give him this thing where you squeeze this thing and see how strong you are. I'm sure Zach would crush that thing. <laughs> <laughs> so he squeezes this thing, and uh, he gives it back to him. At the end of the day, that man squeezed higher pressure than anybody in the whole market. God is truly an amazing God. Now, whether your deliverance in your journey comes miraculously, instantaneously, or it's an accelerated thing, or it's by the way of help with a medical field and whatever, however it comes, let's just be thankful to God that he is healing us. Amen to that? Amen. Amen. So today we saw that this record with this woman, she had this challenging thing within herself. She, she just confessed within herself that if she could just make it to this teacher that could provide this great deliverance for her, that somehow she would be healed. She breaks against the law. She breaks against tradition. She breaks against the whatever it is, and she reaches and attains her deliverance. And then in the end, she comes clean. She tells him the whole thing. And Jesus, aware of this, ministers to her on a very personal level and provides that total wholeness and healing that she was needing for her life. A parallel thing that we can suss to was the whole record of the good seed, right? The sower and the seed and going out. The seed is always good, but where it falls, we don't know. The good thing is, is we got this huge field, lots of different reactions, and we don't know what's going to happen for people. How long is it going to take for that seed to germinate? Don't know. But I'm thankful for whatever does happen for those folks as they reach out to our God and they keep reaching and extending themselves towards the Savior that's going to help bring that total wholeness to their life by way of God our Father. So Heavenly Father... We sure love you and are truly thankful for all that you do for us on so many different levels and in so many different ways. Thank you for the folks in our congregation that are seeking you out and are looking for some relief. Thank you for those people that we are yet to come in contact with. And as we share your great love and maybe a personal incident or a record from the past, whatever it is that helps increase their believing so that they can just reach out and bring faith and Jesus together and get their total wholeness and deliverance on so many different levels. Father, we're so thankful to you and we love you for the great ways that you've provided for us to be able to live in this life and succeed. And thank you for Jesus Christ who is our peace treaty with you that reconciles us to you and makes us whole on so many different levels. So thanks for this. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.